Have you been concerned about brain health in context of sleep and insomnia? Maybe you've had trouble sleeping and you've heard that this supposedly can affect our brain health. Well, if so, this episode of Heard Online may be really helpful for you because this is a common concern. And it did, you know, an article that we're going to look at scared Rhoda, who is a member of our community. In fact, uh, we're going to start today's episode of Heard Online by looking uh, at an email uh, that came in from Rhoda. Uh, it was March 22nd uh, that uh, Rhoda wrote, Hi there. Yesterday, I read this article in The Guardian UK about how top brain experts prioritize getting seven to eight hours of sleep. It made me feel afraid again. Could you please point me to any videos Daniel has done to address the question of Alzheimer's or dementia relating to insomnia? And uh, this was uh, a message, you know, an email that got to Nerissa, our virtual assistant, and um, she directed over to our Heard Online series where we have looked at this before, but uh, I thought we could look at the specific article that had uh, that frazzled Rhoda today. So without further ado, let us take a look at it. So here it is. The, the title is Excellent Evidence That This Works, How Mind Experts Protect Their Brains. And, you know, uh, as for our trigger-o-meter, uh, for those who are not familiar, from one to five, one is least triggering headline and five is most triggering headline. I'd say that this is not particularly triggering. Maybe we'll give it a, you know, two because it's still a little like, you know, uh, just saying that mind experts protect their brain. That's a little, little, little tricky there, um, which we'll, you know, we'll talk more about that topic in a second. But basically, let's, uh, let's keep, let's start right from the beginning here. It says, while sleep and exercise are top priorities, strict diets and supplements aren't essential in most academics routines kind of like a you know unspecific claims they're nothing really tangible they're just kind of like some sweeping remarks i think i think this is the author Ginny mansberg and Ginny has written a book it says here at the end but i can just share it with you called save your brain so it's save your brain by dr Ginny mansberg and it's available through murdoch books and I, I believe that The Guardian works in a way that, uh, you know, people like Dr. Mansberg here can submit an article. Uh, so it's not necessarily written by journalists at the magazine, which is helpful to think about as we go through this. So let's, let's, let's start reading this article. So Dr. Mansberg says, brain health can be a heavy subject. By midlife, many of us are caring for parents or in-laws affected by dementia. It's a stark reminder of our own brain's vulnerability. You know, when I, you know, I'll just take a quick pause here. Like if you're sort of already in a frazzled state and you, and you come, come across this article and start reading it, you can automatically go like, oh yeah, a reminder of the vulnerability. Oh, my brain is vulnerable. Oh, I have to do something to protect my brain, which I think is sort of the intent with using this language, saying that the brain is vulnerable. It automatically makes us kind of like, uh, you, you know, think that, oh, my brain can be damaged. It can be hurt. I have to do something. It gets our attention in a way. And I think that's, of course, the purpose. But in reality, what does it really mean when you, we say, like, our brain is vulnerable? Uh, is it more vulnerable than, like, you know, a finger or an eye or a toenail or anything else? I don't know. Either we can say that nothing is particularly vulnerable or everything is vulnerable. But this really doesn't mean anything saying that this is a stark reminder of a brain's vulnerability. It's just kind of a semantic trick, if you will, that when we have, you know, when we're in more in the more of a state of peace of mind and we're reading this, we can see through that, but that can be tricky when we're not. So just, just a reminder that, uh, you know, when we are frazzled, thinking, things can kind of affect us differently. And let's keep reading. That's not to mention the ocean of information that exists on the subject, so deep that sifting through it all can be its own brain teaser. How much sauerkraut really should we be eating? Must we cut out drinking completely? Do those brain training games really do anything? In my book, Save Your Brain, I try to demystify these tips by speaking to 22 mind experts from around the world. They share their advice, of course, but they also share something far more revealing, their own practices when it comes to brain health. Here's what I learned. So basically what um, 
doctor, uh, uh, what was the man's, man's, uh, Mansberg says here is that, uh, you know, there's so much information out there, which can, you know, you know, it can be so much work at going through all this information. So instead of that, what we're going to do is we're just going to, we're just going to see how we're going to ask these brain experts, how they conduct their lives. And we're going to assume that they're living their lives in the kind of most brain protective way. And that makes it so much easier for it. Then we can just copy what they're doing. And, you know, I, you, you can understand this. You, you can sort of see the logic behind this, but you're sort of making a huge, huge like assumption, which is that the way you're assuming that the way these uh, experts are conducting their lives is like scientifically backed that there is like, you know, rigorous studies showing that this is statistically significantly improving your chances of not getting Alzheimer's or dementia, which isn't true at all. It's just that these people happen to be doing this and that's their habit. And it really doesn't say anything in itself about any outcome, you know, but it, this was the premise of, of this article. So really wanted to share that. Um, and, uh, but, but I think this is a, a very good point though. Like there is so much information out there about like what we should and shouldn't do to like protect our brain that of course that in itself is anxiety producing because it implies that, you know, there, there are things we can do or not do that will impact the likelihood of us getting Alzheimer's, which in reality, in my world, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I know, uh, there is no evidence that our diet or lifestyle uh, has a, you know, it, 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 there's a causal relationship between that and Alzheimer's. You know, just like there's no causal relationship established between lifestyle and, uh, you know, um, you know, um, but you know, what I'm saying, there's no causal relationship established between sleep amount and health outcomes. You know, if we sleep little or we have insomnia, that has not been shown to cause any health issues. I believe it's the same thing when it comes to like, you know, the things you mentioned here, like sauerkraut, drinking, uh, brain training games. I, I, to, to my knowledge, there's no backing, no evidence showing that these things have a causal link to Alzheimer's whatsoever. And I think that to me, it can be really helpful to know because then we can see like, it doesn't matter how much sauerkraut I eat. It doesn't matter if I have alcohol or not, you know, that's not where, that's not what it's, what it's about. So anyway, let's keep reading. Am I sharing this uh, with you? Yes. Exercise is the first topic here. Exercise, do it properly. Everyone I spoke to exercises. And you know, that can sound initially like, oh, if every single of the brain experts she spoke to exercises, that must mean that exercise is important for the brain. But it really doesn't prove that at all. If we think about who becomes a brain expert, right? Who becomes a presumably a professor who runs their own like independent experiments, maybe has their own lab, etc. It's probably a pretty driven person. You know, it's like probably a type a person who's like health conscious who's like maybe a little bit of a perfectionist like a driven person like that who probably exercises you know I, I don't think there's any surprise i don't think it has any predictive value as far as alzheimer's or dementia or anything like that goes anyways that's, that's the first sentence and then uh she goes on and we're not talking slow strolling once a week dr rebecca thurston a professor from the university of Pittsburgh whose research covers brain aging in women, works out six days a week. Her regimen is structured and involves a mix of cardio, strength training, yoga, and online HIIT exercises. Uh, and Professor Victor, Victor Henderson also exercises a lot. And so, uh, you know, we already talked about how this is not predictive, but I think to me, uh, zooming out a little, little bit more big picture here, to me, this article highlights why, you know, why why would there is a lot of struggle, uh, like internal struggles, like because we're we're told that there's so many things we can control in our lives that will impact like how we sleep, how long we live, like our liver function, our heart function, so we can easily, you know, s s get into this mindset of like doing, doing, doing. I have to do this. I have to perfect this. I have to control this. You know, which would naturally leads to like a lot of performance anxiety, a lot of guilt if we're not doing enough, but it can lead to health anxiety, et cetera. So 
the, you know, the big picture here is like, uh huh. This is this is one of the reasons uh, you know we have so much health anxiety and so much so much inner struggles in, in like you know in in 2023. Uh, you know, a little bit of simplification of mine, but that that came to my mind. And yeah, with that said, this is already going. We're already at ten minutes. Uh, well, let's get to the sleep part. So, the heart matters. Uh, she says most experts see a GP regularly. Again, doesn't really predict anything. Most experts watch what they eat, but few are dogmatic. Okay. Sleep is serious. This is it. These two little paragraphs is the only mention of sleep in this whole article. Uh, getting seven to eight hours of quality shut eye per night is top of mind for all experts. Henderson's, despite his caffeine intake, has no trouble sleeping. He's naturally good at it. Now, uh, you know, knowing what the prevailing, you know, sentiment about sleep is within you know academia, what media reports, what you know, and you know, non for profits like the you know the Sleep Foundation et cetera, say. Is it surprising that uh, a bunch of professors say they're prioritizing sleep? Not at all. It's just like just as surprising as hearing them say that they're not smoking, you know, or that they're exercising. It's like the 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 idea that health includes sleeping a certain amount is is very prevalent. So. I don't think it's a surprise to say that many of them prioritize sleep, whatever that means. And, and now, here, this is interesting. Not everyone is so lucky. Thurston has struggled with sleep from time to time. When insomnia hits, she uses CBTI, a form of cognitive behavioral therapy, targeted insomnia as a remedy. Now, actually, I didn't see this first time, but if we go back, Thurston, wasn't that the same person? Yep, <laughs> here we go. Dr. Rebecca Thurston, is, is the same lady who is working out six days a week doing cardio, strength training. Are we surprised that uh, Dr. Thurston has insomnia? Uh, not at all, actually, because we know that sleep is a passive process. The more you try, the more struggle you have. And we can tell just from the little things we know about Dr. Thurston, she's a very driven person, health conscious, type A. So we're not surprised that she has insomnia because, again, Sleep is a passive process, but if we have that kind of like type A personality, we can often start to try to control things that we don't have control over, and then we have some struggle. And then, uh, you know, using CBTI when insomnia hits, to me, t tells us a little bit about CBTI. It, it's like, you know, what we want, of course, is something that teaches us the root cause of insomnia. What is it about, you know? Uh, why are we thinking this way? Why are you feeling this way? Something that explains it on a foundational level, something that leads us to abandon the struggle, abandon trying to control sleep, because then then we don't struggle with insomnia anymore. Then it's resolved, you know, indefinitely. And the fact that somebody uses something over and over when it hits, it reminds us more of like using a pill or a supplement. And to me, it 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 kind of speaks to what I think th th there's th some things lacking in CBTI, uh, which I think this kind of really highlights. Uh, but yeah, I, I think in summary for, to me, this, this kind of highlights how there's nothing there. It's all smoke and mirrors. It's, there's nothing, there's no, nothing substantial that shows that little sleep in any way causes uh, any problems with, you know, Alzheimer's dementia or anything else. Um, and, uh, you know, the final point here is that I think uh, it's sort of another angle here is that when we're, we're, when we're saying that, oh, if you just live very, oh, I forgot to sh share that, but like the last part, actually, we can take a look at that real quick. The last part here, say, uh, here is like um, the, the uh, a final word. These messages may be boring, but they can essentially just be instil instilled to just keep healthy. Okay, so that's the summary here. She says, just keep healthy. And if we think about someone who has Alzheimer's or whose parents have Alzheimer's and we say like, oh, it's just a matter of keeping healthy. What are we saying? Are we saying that a person who has Alzheimer's disease that they, they weren't healthy enough? You know, they weren't doing enough. They weren't taking care of themselves enough. It can easily lead to this kind of path of like judging people, you know, which then leads to this poor person like judging themselves and feeling guilty, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I understand, of course, that it's appealing to us as humans to, to think that, oh, we can prevent, we can do this, we can control. 
But then the, fl the flip side of that becomes um, if, if we're trying to control something that we cannot control, and I believe that is true for very many things, I think there's my understanding of Alzheimer's is that, to, to my knowledge, there's nothing we can do to, to, to prevent it uh, in terms of like lifestyle. Um, it's a, you know, it's a genetic condition, but it, it can actually be liberating to see that there's nothing we can do in terms of lifestyle to prevent it because that keeps us from so much struggle, so much achieving, so much trying, so much anxiety, and also from the guilt. If we or somebody else ha gets Alzheimer's, we're not going to blame that person uh, for it, you know? So uh, these were my thoughts as I was reading this article. Um, hope that it this was helpful to you, Rhoda, if you heard this uh, or anyone else. But as always, um, please let me know what you thought. What were your thoughts? What were your yeah, yeah, what came to your mind as we were going through this and we shall go from there. But again, thank you for being here. Thank you for, for, um, for tuning in and, uh, look forward to having you back here real soon. That was it for her online today. Bye for now.